Hey everybody, this is part three of uh, Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah. And it's currently 7.18 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 20th, 2019, I'm told. Um, yeah, who knows what time it'll be uh, when I get done with this video. Because there's going to be uh, a lot of stopping and starting on my end uh, just to work us through uh, these subsections to get us to a point for me uh, after reading uh, this over a couple of times uh, first off because uh, whether it was uh, deliberate or not uh, this this author uh, and I want to uh, be clear Lance S. Owens is who this is attributed to whether he meant to or not, the sections uh, in this paper <laughs> leading up to, uh, I guess leading up to his point, but I think there's actually a greater point to the entire paper as a whole. Uh, anybody out there <clears throat> who is uh, LDS or uh, an LDS <laughs> sympathizer or uh, promoter and uh, the reason I say it like that is because uh, for instance guys like uh, Jan Irvin uh, have been promoting this idea that even though he says he's a Christian He's promoting this idea that, that the Bible is incomplete. Of course, he has um, um, he has a, a gentleman on, uh, I believe, frequently. Uh, this is the same gentleman who's done a, a great deal of work on the Kafir. And his Kafir work, I would say, is very interesting, very informative, too. Of course, I can't remember his name. Doesn't matter. He's been on there a number of times promoting this idea that the Bible is not more than natural law. When you put it all together as a whole, those who don't see it as simply just an expression of natural law of are, of course, ignoramuses. And, of course, this is the way Ian Irving approaches it, too. In fact, anything that is different than or, or contrary to something that Ian Irving believes or promotes, you have to be ignorant uh, to, to believe something contrary to him. I uh, hate to tell you, but, I mean, I view the guy... Um, as uh, in many ways, especially that this idea, because this is precisely how he treats people. Um, I have heard people make very intelligent comments uh, about these things. And what I'm doing, I'm getting to the point where he, he and other guests have, have really just, just put together a great hodgepodge of what anyone could call religious texts slash historical texts <clears throat> and said that they were all complementary to one another um, don't buy it folks uh, he hasn't done the research nor has his guests to really prove any of that and when he does things like that, when he tells people that certain comments they make that are contrary to these ideas are uninformed or ignorant, that's just a tactic. That's simply a tactic. It is an ad hominem tactic. It's also a logical fallacy tactic, and it's shaming. So don't fall for it. Don't buy it. Now, I'm going to be straightforward with you. So those people who are LDS or Mormon or, you know, sympathizers of Joseph Smith as a pure prophet of the God of the Bible, Yahweh, you're not going to like what I have to say. Um, I've spent enough time now, not just in this document, but in other documents concerning Smith, uh, purported translations, writings, no, I haven't gone over all of his letters that he either wrote or dictated. Um, I've had to do 
as much of an overview as I can. And of course, my knowledge is going to be limited on this. Everybody's is, I think, to a degree. The problem I have is this. What information that there is out there concerning this subject? Joseph Smith. And was he a pure prophet? Was he not? Uh, the events of his life, the controversies of his life, the controversy of his death, and uh, uh, the time of, of uh, the LDS in, in Illinois and, and things that happened there, and then uh, the changing over to Brigham Young, the move to Utah, events in Utah. These are controversial subjects. They are a vein of history, in a sense, all to themselves. However, they do tie into the big picture, the whole. Um, but it's, it's a lot of content. It's a lot of content. So, the idea was not to read a document out loud that this guy had published, but to actually branch off of this because, ah, uh, I got to tell you, folks, after, after a double reading of this, there are branches to this that we're going to get to that are, oh, they're going to bear so much fruit. Yes, they are. They're going to bear so much fruit. Now, I want to say something. Now that I've said that, um, I, I want to commend. For, I, I do. I want, I want to genuinely commend uh, the LDS Church, or Mormons. And I have to say it both ways because it seems like, well, these days, these days they seem to go more by, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or LDS. I know there is also RLDS, and the two maybe, you know, butt heads. However, this document was published by LDS. Let's see. It was originally published in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. So, unless I'm entirely mistaken, and RLDS and LDS both consider themselves Mormon, and you have to be extremely familiar with what's what, their publications, and the differences. Um, it says the paper received considerable notice, and in 1995, the Mormon History Association recognized Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah, the occult connection, with its annual award for the best article in Mormon studies. I mean, it said a digital reproduction of the original print article is available on academia.edu and at the University of Utah Library. And the thing is, for anybody who wants to read this, and I, I do provide the link to this article on every one of these videos so far, um... You're, I, I think if you know you pay close attention as you read to to how he words things and the way that he either sometimes negates I think the real impact of each one of these occult I don't know if I should say uh, occult disciplines as he goes sometimes negating as I said uh, the real impact of them on the world and on Christianity at large, or just sometimes seems to neutralize them. And then the way that uh, he... The way that he sort of contextualizes them into Joseph Smith, claims made about him, documents that have surfaced as of late, so on and so forth, uh, tells me that this guy is a very talented uh, Mormon apologist. So back to the, the preemptive. Okay, so I told you a lot of people pro-Mormon, pro, pro pro-Joseph pro Smith as a prophet, as a pure prophet of the, of the God of the, the Bible are going to be probably upset with me as we go forward. However, 
I want to say this about Mormons, LDS. These folks, these folks in general, are extremely moral people uh, in their deeds, uh, their actions, their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, on, on average, a, a typical LDS, typical Mormon, uh, is, is very moral. Let's be clear about that. You know, moral, ethical. Um, and at, at a far higher level, than your typical Judeo-Christian slash evangelical. Because evangelicals, if you're in an evangelical denomination, you are Judeo-Christian. Same with Catholics. Sorry, Catholics out there. You're, you're going to have to, if you think I'm, I'm being unfair, you're going to have to go back and reread Vatican II and see the Judeo-Christianity all over it. They're just two peas in a pod. I'm sorry, but Catholicism and, and, and evangelicalism, they're just anymore these days. They're just two peas in a pod. And, and they're all, they're all Judeo-Christianity. So, in general, as compared to your typical Judeo-Christian, they, they, their morals are, are far higher. Their practice uh, uh, morally is higher. And I have to commend them for, for this one other thing, and then I'll move on. After World War II, when um, Eisenhower had that, 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 that deviant, that, that, that wicked criminal man, Eisenhower, had changed the uh, classification of millions of German prisoners of war to disarmed enemy combatants. Therefore, since, since they had a, a completely different categorization, they didn't fall under the Geneva Convention, and he could herd them into open pens outside, freezing, uh, exposed to the elements, no water. A, a little a bowl of, of, of watered-down-nothing soup every day. If anybody tried to, to slip the fence to, to get to the river, which was right near where they kept them in open pens, they shot them. Okay? That was how they, they, they first treated the POWs, who, by the way, any time a German had a POW, they were treated with the utmost care and respect. Don't you believe any of this garbage you see? Uh, coming out of Hollywood. None of it. So for years after the war, for years after the war, there was a concerted plan to murder as many German people as possible, to murder them and to breed them out, which is why so many Soviet soldiers raped so many German women from six years old to 80 years old, these, these women. Plus, many allies, many Americans, raped these German women. Many, many Americans. There was over a thousand court-martials over Americans raping them. The French were encouraged to rape Germans. Now, <clears throat> They did everything in their power to create a blackout of information to the West concerning what was going on in Germany against the Germans after the war. Um, but there was some information that was getting through. To his credit, ex-president Herbert Hoover went to Europe and made a full report on what was going on. It was very unpopular. In fact, that book that he wrote that contains that very comprehensive report on what was going on is very difficult to get today. So, with the very little information that was coming to the West, there was some coming to America about what was going on in Germany. Only two Christian groups really pressed the issue and went to Germany to help these people. 
One were the Quakers, which historically all you'll ever hear is probably very skewed, uh, unkind things about Quakers, and Mormons, LDS. Mormons went over to Germany to help those people. Mormons in our day do a great deal of good towards others. So, I can't stress enough that even though, even though uh, those who may be LDS or Mormon th that would hear this, or, or sympathetic to the idea of Joseph Smith as, as a prophet, uh, are going to uh, dislike a number of the things I'm going to say. Please know that the people the people, the, the common LDS people, you know, I think in general are, are very salt-of-the-earth people. And as I said, in general, in general, they keep a better standard of morals and ethics than the typical Judeo-Christians. So that includes, in my mind, evangelicals and Catholics alike. Now, I do know that, for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses in general hold a higher standard than the Judeo-Christians. Um, Seventh-day Adventists tend to hold a higher standard in moral, ethical life than Judeo-Christians. Good night, people. I mean, let's think about that for a minute. All of these, uh, these sects of Christianity that get so much flack Think about the propaganda. Think about the propaganda that gets so much flack from evangelical Christianity, maybe Catholicism as well, Judeo-Christianity in general. These people in general keep a higher moral standing than you. <laughs> and you say, well, not me as an individual. I'm, you know, I keep a good, you know, moral standing. Well, uh, maybe you do, but in general, in general. So that that is my that is my commendation, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for what the Mormons did for my people, the Germans, after World War II. I mean that warms my heart to know what they did, because somebody had to somebody. Somebody had to do something, because nobody was doing nothing. The, uh, the Jews that had left Germany, that for some reason they were allowed to immediately enlist in the army, even though they had just come and immigrated to America in the 30s, uh, put them right in the army, and oftentimes in very high positions, all surrounding, uh, for instance, all of the German officers uh, that were taken captive, uh, the ones who they say they were given confessions of, of Jewish death camps and, and, and other things. You know, they're surrounded entirely by Jews, uh, and the impropriety there is unbelievable beating confessions out of these men, torturing them, breaking the Geneva Convention, of course, by stealing from their persons. Anyways, I'm so thankful to know that at least two groups, the Quakers and the Mormons, went over there and helped relieve those suffering people who were being tortured. Tortured. By who? By Jews and Americans, and various Russians, and the French, spearheaded by Jews, Jewish interests. So thank you very much. Any Mormon who's listening, I, I offer you the, my deepest thanks. And Mormonism, because of, as I've said, they, they've done so much good. So in this, in this article, as I said, uh, Mr. Owens, uh, I do want to commend him for being a, a 
extremely talented um, Mormon apologist. But I think, for one thing, it's really great. We're going to have to follow slightly his, um, his train of thought as he goes because he's going to get this to the end. He's going to get us to Nauvoo, Illinois. He's going to get us to Joe Smith and not just Nauvoo. I mean, he moved to Nauvoo later on. Um, as did, you know, uh, a, a good deal of LDS, though there were, uh, by this time, there were LDS um, pockets kind of uh, growing uh, in, in more parts of the country and everything, but this is a little later on. There are going to be questions, though, that I'm going to have to bring up as we go. Um, first off, uh, of course, it doesn't seem like we've got... Uh, the picture that I, because the majority of the people that are probably going to be listening to this have heard the general Joseph Smith narrative, uh, whether it be for good or for bad, for good or for bad, because whether it be for good or for bad, the basic Joseph Smith narratives kind of paints him as a lone figure, whether it be a, a lone prophet discovering these plates uh, with the angel appearing to him, or whether it be the negative narrative of the the lone con man um, who pulled off yada, 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 yada. What I'm seeing as a subtext, based on what I know about history, um, the fact that there's no such thing as accidental history, certainly not for hundreds of years. Well, we know that there's not accidental history when it comes to putting this in the, the viewpoint of uh, our Aliyim, Yahweh. Nothing's accidental. <clears throat> but as far as man goes, too, let's, let's just be real clear about that. Um, and I'm seeing in the time frame that we have to work with here, Okay, we're looking at a 16-year time frame. And I'm having a lot of trouble swallowing this idea that whether people want to sell him off as a con man or a pure prophet, this 16-year time frame and the things that happened in that time all of the things that got cooking and moving in that time are difficult for me to rationalize as organic or as him being singular, even from the very start. Uh, what I'm seeing is something that was already put in the works, was already preconceived. So, the last time, or even in the last two videos, we've, we've talked a bit about what this author has to say about Kabbalah, because he does first spend a really good amount of time on Kabbalah, and what he has to say about Kabbalah as being, and now he doesn't call it necessarily Jewish mysticism, he leaves the ism out of it. Uh, but definitely a Jewish mystical tradition. And he's very clear about it, just a few concepts, the Adam Kadman concept, as in God reflecting himself from above in man below, and in a sense being um, that man. Uh, we're talking about what he talks about let's say, um, is Kabbalah touching that divine in the sense that they said, first off, the way that he, uh, I'm sorry, the way that uh, Kabbalah would be anthropomorph, non-anthropomorphizing, um, because the, the idea of like uh, typical uh, Catholic and evangelical Christianity is the anthropomorphization of God. 
as in he doesn't have a form, um, but sometimes maybe he'll take form just for the sake of man, and if he uses languages, language like his eyes, his hands, his arm, uh, that he's being anthropomorphic. Uh, however, Kabbalah, they say, would see him as a being with a form like a man, uh, and that Adam, uh, to go further or deeper in Kabbalah, they have this idea of Adam Kadmon, uh, an actual representation not only in form, but in a sense in spirit and power of the divine. Um, and you know, there, there could be uh, quite a lot of Kabbalistic um, thought behind that, that is retained uh, and carried down through the ages. You know, okay, Talmudic, he doesn't mention the Talmud, but, and I understand, all right, just the Kabbalah because of what we're talking about. If we're talking about a certain mystical experience that is going to be observed in a number of occult disciplines uh, down through the years that you know they may not necessarily include um, anything Mishnaic uh, or the Talmud um, as that would be maybe considered a very different rabbinical principle. I don't necessarily see it as altogether different. Um, more like two sides to the same coin. Um, and you know, there, there is a lot that the, there's a lot that the rabbis articulate in the Talmud that it seems to me is only just reverberated in Kabbalah. I think the bottom line that anybody should recognize is the Kabbalah is absolutely distinctly Jewish. I don't, anybody who argues with that, I, I don't know what leg you really have to stand on. Now, influences. He starts with Kabbalah and Christianity. And he makes, honestly, his perspective on it is arguable, perhaps. However, the fact is that Let's put this in context. So, he says, these ideas are, are very much expressed in the artistic and scientific and, and philosophical uh, ideas that we see uh, being given birth to in the Renaissance. Now, uh, is that, is it true that the Kabbalah was behind, or the blend, I'm sorry, the blend of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, or let's say Talmudism too, but he's saying just Kabbalah, mixed with Christianity, giving birth to the Renaissance as far as the expressions of it may be. I'll concede that. Absolutely a maybe. Why is because the Reformation. Okay, a lot of people start the Reformation with, let's say, Jan Hus, a hundred years before Luther. And Luther is in the early 1500s. So, do we have a progression from the overt, um, let's say, in a context of Catholicism, the Renaissance, <laughs> uh, giving birth to or expressing overtly a blend of Judaism, which I think would be more fair to see 
Talmudically and Kabbalistically, although you've got to keep Talmud out of there because that's going to be uh, that's going to be something that uh, they're going to want to apply more to Jewish civil social constructs in a, in a very different way. Okay, so we can talk about just spiritual thought because here's the thing. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that I believe that one of the big problems with how people to this day perceive the New Testament and then they're going to take this perception of the New Testament and they're going to use it as a light to shine all over the Old Testament. It is, in my opinion, certain portions of it, certain ideas, doctrines, dogmas are hyper-spiritualized. I'm not taking away from the spiritual aspect of the Bible, but that's the entire Bible. That's Genesis to Revelation. There is a spiritual aspect. There is a spiritual aspect and there is an Adamic aspect. And there is a relationship between Yahweh, who is spirit, and Adam, who is flesh, with the spirit of Yahweh breathed into him. But it's entirely possible to hyper-spiritualize things. And I see that done. How much of an influence did Kabbalah have in that? Maybe a lot. What we call the Reformation today, I see as a, as a sort of a, a very thick, very, in some ways, oppressive cloud that the popular church has been languishing beneath for centuries now. Centuries now. You still have Lutheran churches that haven't really changed doctrine much in hundreds of years. And you know, I suppose if the doctrine was right on the money, why should you change it, right? Um, however, the doctrine wasn't right on the money. So that's a problem. And unfortunately, I don't see a progression since that time. In many ways, I just see regression. So he follows a chain of thought, and I'm going to have to hit some of these chains of thought he follows because they become important as we get to the climax. So he follows Christian Kabbalah in the sense of its expression through the Renaissance, and absolutely, absolutely there is Jewish thought an expression loud and clear in the Reformation for anyone who wants to see it. Martin Luther himself, the, the very guy, the very guy who wrote the treatise on the Jews and their lies, is still expressing throughout that document a set of ideas that are as I said, seeing the New Testament and thus the Old Testament through a light that is in some very erroneous ways hyper-spiritualizing certain things. This is a guy who still believes in a eternal conscious torment and fire and others and, and, and other things that, by the way, we can see this concept in the Talmud prior to that. Can we see it in the Kabbalah? Maybe. Anybody who knows the answer to that, put it in the comments. So then he goes on to the Hermetic Kabbalistic worldview. Now his bit on Hermeticism is definitely worth uh, a few decent quotes because <laughs> Hermeticism, I think, is something that we quite often hear talked about. Um, but I think we don't often know what's being gotten at in Hermeticism. Now, we often hear those things like, as above, so below. And if 
this author, Lance Owens, is following a very coherent path as he brings us from the Kabbalah of old, which he says was spawned 500, 600 years ago, and gave its expression through, by the way, items like pseudepigraphal writings, uh, the Zohar. It's, it's pseudepigraphical. I mean, that's weird. But it's not when we consider it in context of Judaism in general. Then it's no, it's it's absolutely not. Nobody putting their name on this. I mean, that's problem number one. Um Yeah. Okay, so maybe that was because um there would have been far too much controversy because of the ideas that Kabbalah expresses to put one's name on it at the time. Um, again, one would have to look at that in the light of, but was that a good thing or a bad thing? Because, for instance, even in America now, they are in the process of passing legislation which would make it unlawful to criticize things that are, are absolutely um, derived by Jewish thought, um, committed by Jews themselves, by uh, an extraordinarily uh, tribal um, attitude, which also has uh, as its center uh, core focus Jewish supremacism. Now, within that context, there has been that context before, by the way. And I'm sure that people within that context had to work in a more subtle way it is unfortunate that America, as Ernst Zundel uh, fantasized about it, being still, for all its problems, yet a bastion and repository of free speech, it seems like these powers are working feverishly to make it less than that. They have done that with the Internet, by the way. You can see that in the absolute monopolization of search engines, providers. If all search engines deem a certain website to be, uh, to be dangerous, they can all essentially block it to where you can't even get to it. I mean, are all of us going to have to start now turning to uh, figuring out how to use Tor software and going underground? So you see, some movements are underground because the uh, atmosphere around them will not tolerate it because there are still good laws. Some things are underground for the exact opposite reasons. So he says concerning the hermetic Kabbalistic worldview, Christian Kabbalah was not a re recapitulation of the Jewish tradition, but its creative remolding, a metamorphosis engendered by newly aroused religion-making vision. Though it would be too bold to judge Gnosticism a legitimate historical parent, this movement was arguably encouraged and fostered by distant transmissions and legacies of the old heresy. In the broad creative confluence of Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and alchemy were numerous eddies and countercurrents. Like early Christian Gnosticism, the tradition reborn had a dynamism which bred creative reinterpretation and the important and subtle distinctions among its various redactions form the subject of specialized study. Nonetheless, there are a few themes echoed so often by 16th and 17th century proponents of this alternative, reformative, philosophic, and religious vision, which I hereafter refer to simply as Hermeticism, that they may serve almost as its hallmarks. Now, I am going to do my best, as limited as I am, to not only simplify uh, what he just said 
but read on the second paragraph and try to boil that down somewhat. What he said, in an extremely talented way, I would add, is not only extremely verbose, which I know that a lot of my writings and talks can be the same, but he is also expressing first off an admission of the, this is my words, erroneous thought to Gnosticism. And I've said before, by the way, that Gnosis as a pure word is not a bad thing, by the way, it's not. Gnosticism. And this, of course, is, 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 is in that whole realm of, of sophistry that tends to cause so much confusion, absolute utter confusion. And I'm telling you, there, there, is, there is so much historically to what we could call the occult in the sense of just being hidden, because therein is the great difference between these various disciplines and pure Bible practice is because the truth, when it is exposed to the light, has nothing to fear. In fact, when exposed to the light, the truth is in harmony with the light. However, these things do not bring themselves fully out into the light. They are, by their very nature, dualistic. They have an overt nature and a covert nature. This is why the heart of so many of these things is dualistic. So, so what he says is, he first off makes an excuse or justification for Christ, Christian Kabbalah and uh, for what he's going to get into with Hermeticism because he says, which I think is accurate, that Hermeticism is actually just a number of uh, various expressions of the mingling of what should be and I don't know because he's, he, he doesn't clarify himself. But I'm going to assume that he's talking about Christianity as its Hellenized expression of purely what the Bible has to say. So that's, that's, that is a difference already mixed with this specifically Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. And he's saying that Hermeticism is not necessarily something you can pin down as a, a singular expression, but a bunch of varied sorts of veins of expression that are going to then manifest themselves in certain ways as the years progress. Now he says in the next paragraph. The first of these essential elements was mentioned above. Humankind is the bearer of an uncreated, divine, immortal spark. Now that is different than what the Bible says. This theme was mirrored in the next keynote developed in both Kabbalistic and Hermetic sources. There is a duality in creation. Says the Zohar, quote, the process of creation has taken place on two planes, one above and one below. The lower occurrence corresponds to the higher." Unquote. This dictum appeared in almost identical wording in the earliest Hermetic works. The revered text of the Tabula Smaragdina, <laughs> Smaragdina considered the summation of Hermetic wisdom and attributed to the Hermes Trismegistos. I know I've heard this before, Trismegistos, sorry, the Hermes Trismegistos, echoes this cryptic formula as its central mystical truth. Quote, that which is below is above, 
that above is also below. Unquote. The exegetical possibilities of this simple text plied the imagination of new hermetic philosophers. There are, they suggested, two realms of reality. Call them heaven and earth, spirit and matter, God and man, in relation to each other, shadowing each other. What happens in one realm echoes in the other. The divine life reflects itself in the life of women and men and they, by their intentions and actions, affect the divine. Why did I say from the start, this is me, why did I say from the start that that's not reflected in the Bible? Because it's not. Now, they just said, he said, the first of these essential elements was mentioned, humankind is the bearer of an uncreated divine immortal spark, as if... As if, now, he's getting very much into, I believe, he's getting very much into what would be um, core Mormon thought. You see, the Bible actually says that when Yahweh created Adam, and we're talking Genesis 2 now, we're not talking Genesis 1, Genesis 2, which is not a retelling of Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, Yahweh creates this Adam, and into his nostrils does he breathe this spirit of life. Now that is such a very important item in Scripture, and I believe that it is not by mere chance that we see that. Now, we do see Genesis 1, and he says, let us create Adam after our own likeness. But there is a subtle difference between 1 and 2, and a not-so-subtle difference between 1 and 2. Now, I went over this in an older video, Genesis 1 is not Genesis 2. Now, it was part <clears throat> of a series I had started on fiat language, which is not through. It's just at that point in time, I was having some serious trouble with the characters of Obri that I'm not having the same trouble with today. It's just I haven't picked that back up. It is on the channel. You can take a look at that. But let's just go right to this uncreative, divine, immoral spark, immortal spark that humankind, humankind is the bearer of. The Bible doesn't say that. Now, when he quotes the Zohar, the process of creation has taken place on two planes, one above and one below. Now, this, right, he's getting into the heart of everything that I've heard about Hermeticism, that which is beloved above is below. And he goes on to say uh, two realms of reality, right? Call them heaven and earth, spirit, matter. Duality. Always this duality. God and man. Now you see, when I read that, and I consider a sort of philosophical core to that, I can't help but think of the well, the quote from Isaiah 14. Well, the whole chapter really in Isaiah 14 where Yahweh is specifically speaking through the prophet to a king who would live long after him, the king of Babel, and how this king imagines himself to be as God. This, of course, is oftentimes translated as having something to do with this spirit being called Satan. There's absolutely nothing in the text to lead one to believe that that is what's going on. He's speaking to a future king. And it is extremely sarcastic, the language that is used, his fantasies of being so godlike, of having this uncreated divine immortal spark. when the Bible says something far different. So something that is entirely 
uh, too important to pass up, is that he says that in the vein of this thought called Hermeticism, man below reflected the divine form above, the influential 17th century Hermetic philosopher Robert Flood interpreted this idea to imply a spiritual creation which preceded the physical. God's first creation stated Flood was, quote, an archetype whose substance is incorporeal, invisible, intellectual, and sempiternal, after whose model and divine image and beauty and form of the real world are constructed. So, an idea that the spiritual man was constructed in its whole before the physical man ever was. Now consider the ideologies of Mormonism um, and what was far before this current creation fits very, as far as I'm concerned, uh, fits very seamlessly with the ideas that this LDS apologist has just articulated. Um, now he goes on to talk about the sciences and, and how Hermeticism affected the sciences. Anybody out there who is becoming wise to the sciences that have been expressed for the last four to five centuries and how they are not actual science. They are a religion. They are a highly guarded religion. Those people who are the the current and recent guardians of this pseudoscience religion, they're merely priests of what we see him expressing here that Hermeticism is giving birth to. Because he's saying even with the sciences at this time, we're seeing a sort of twofold mindset with people who, who are now becoming very influential in um, philosophical and scientific thought. That um, science and magic are two expressions of the same venture. Um, if I can find his, his quote quasi-quickly in here, so this is a little bit disturbing when he says the correspondence of the above and below molded the foundations of two influential disciplines flourishing in the creative society of the 16th and 17th centuries, natural science and magic. In the Hermetic worldview, each was in part a scientific and spiritual study. Science meant knowledge, and knowledge led to intelligence, the divine glory uniting all truth into the wholeness of God's consciousness. Whether the hermetic Kabbalistic Magus ventured to explore the divine hierarchies by magical invocations or the structures of matter by natural science, he found mirrored the same light, dark face of God. Magic and science each offered methodologies for investigating heaven and earth, the mind of God and the structure of nature, microcosmos and macrocosmos. As Pico della Mirandola explained, quote, magic is the practical part of natural sciences. So how many of you out there do not see that principle right there, that mindset right there, that I just read, which this author asserts is, is fundamental in Hermeticism, which of course he calls Hermeticism uh, a, a sort of uh, a, a natural outcropping of Kabbalism mixed with Christianity, which I'm asserting that when he says Christianity, it is that Hellenized Christianity of the time. 
is giving birth to this mentality that the pure pursuit of science is a blend of not only natural scientific observation, but a magical understanding of these spiritual dualistic principles. Now, who is not seeing that being expressed in so much of what today is called science, but in fact is really just a religion? And this last statement in this paragraph I find so telling when he says, The wedding of Kabbalah with the hermetic image of man give, gave birth among many offspring to the magical traditions contrived in this period, represented by Cornelius Agrippa's immensely influential work De Occulta Philosophia, first published in 1533. Quote, Agrippa's Occult Philosophy, unquote. Notes Yeats, now Yeats is more contemporary, is, quote, in fact, a really a religion claiming access to higher powers and Christian science it accepts the name of Jesus as the chief wonder working name unquote. three centuries later these ideas in this text would order the magical rituals and ceremonial implements possessed by members of the Joseph Smith family on the religious frontier of early 19th century America. Now the strange thing is this, as we go, you're going to see this apologist essentially making excuses for what he says would have in a very natural way bled into the subconscious and understanding of Joseph Smith and would then explain um, a lot of absolutely Kabbalistic uh, overtones that one would see uh, in various uh, I could say Mormon maybe just various Joseph Smith expressions um, but I do want to bring attention to something that is at, it's going to be repeated again later when he talks about magic, specifically magic in about two different forms. The thing that I find so interesting is this idea when he says that Yeats says this De Occulta Philosophia, really a religion claiming access to higher powers, but in but it's Christian since it's, it, it accepts the name of Jesus as the chief wonder working name. Why do I find that so interesting? Everybody out there who is a Christian should give, give pause. Now think about this for a minute now. This idea has bothered me for a long time. The idea that the name of Jesus is its own magical talisman. Um, now, you would probably have a lot of uh, modern day uh, apologists for evangelical Christianity, Catholicism, and, and others maybe. Uh, railing against me saying there is power in the name of of Jesus well um so you hear a lot of stories right uh and i <clears throat> i can't tell you 100% um what i think about all of these stories and all of these incidents uh, in which people claim to use the name of Jesus as um, 
you know, a way to break spiritual uh, attacks and and other things where they say that there was this powerful nature to it. I don't claim to be the authority on those instances and what exactly transpired. I don't. What I want to comment on is this. It has bothered me for some time now that there is there is an idea in the back of people's heads that as long as they tack that name onto their prayers that they have given their prayers more power in that the tacking on of that name or 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 as if their prayers should they be uh, a very devoted believer in in the Bible in the God thereof in the Messiah who through various filters uh, we've gotten this name Jesus out of that if the name's not tagged on to a prayer it's going to have no effect and if it's tagged on to a prayer it's going to have more effect as opposed to is the prayer itself as a pretext is is there a pretext to the prayer itself that is considering the will of the God you're praying to as in have you even taken the time to try to get to know what of his will you can uh, through just pure study of Scripture um, and secondly are you examining your heart beforehand as to whether or not that prayer is your will or his and do you know the difference and are you simply using that name like they are um, as the chief wonder working name and as some sort of spiritual spiritual talisman are you performing a magic ritual by sticking that name on a prayer oh I know trust me I know the scripture I know the scripture where he says anything that you ask the Father in my name he'll give it but have you tried asking uh, I don't know have you have you tried asking for a um, an escalade in his name have you got it how many things have you asked for that are either just selfish or things that are not according to his will that you keep asking for in the name of Jesus or you can say Yeshua or you can say Yahweh or whatever you can say um, you show as it actually is either which way have you kept asking in that name thinking that that you know the meaning of what that verse says but you're not getting it and if that's the case and you've done that and you've realized that I, I hope in a way that that can serve as a vehicle to uh, to break this mindset this magical mindset uh, uh, of that name in, in in any form that that you're giving it as a magical thing because I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest with you here I know these scriptures I know what he said uh, but I've got a feeling that maybe in general we haven't quite grasped uh, precisely what it was that he was expressing find that interesting though I find it very interesting uh, that we're seeing in the context of hermeticism this this very this very thing this this very practice and and 
philosophy that does turn the name of Jesus in whatever form you give it into a magical rite of, of great power. Remember, magic, whenever magic's done, what is magic done? Is ma magic is done to, uh, to fulfill the will of the practitioner. Uh, I guess entirely forgetting about the Lord's Prayer in which he says, Thy will be done. Okay, guys, up next is alchemy. I've got a, an extremely rambunctious three-and-a-half-year-old who's <laughs> been running around. Uh, I'm kind of surprised I got through this. But, you know, you got to love them, and I do. Uh, but it's getting very frustrating. However, it, it really wouldn't have mattered because by this point, I, I'd wrap it anyways because I, I just have no intention whatsoever of shortchanging uh, alchemy or the subsections that's going to come after it that are leading up to... Uh, the author's main thesis and core apologetic, which we are going to see if we pay close attention to these things that he's saying on the way to get to this core apologetic of this paper. There's so much of it that's so telling. We have to pay attention to the 1800s. The, 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 the things that happened occurred during the 1800s. They mean so much to us today in the supposed year of 2019 that we can't neglect uh, any of these things. We're going to see what Kabbalah and the Jewish influence is in these things and we have to look at the Jewish influence to certain all items of history we have to look at the Jewish influence just as much as we have to look at the German influence the English influence any influence you you write somebody out of history and you've done everybody a great disservice okay so that you know anybody can throw uh, an anti-semitic tag at me because i want to see uh a, a, i want to see the the jewish component in everything in history and today and i want to be able to analyze it i want to be able to um to give my opinion on it and maybe my opinion is right on the money and maybe my opinion is wrong but i certainly do want the freedom to be able to do that so we need to do that we need to pay attention to these items on our way to something that I um, guarantee you is going to prove to be uh, extraordinarily telling concerning those times, Joseph Smith, and perhaps um, what we're able to figure out about not only Mormonism, um, America's expansion west and a number of other things that happened uh, in that context. Currently, I have uh, a few individuals who have volunteered to do, uh, to, to do various things uh, at various levels uh, concerning the Obrey Project. And I, my heartfelt thanks goes out uh, to anyone. I've, ha I've had various people over the years now who have actually been been so instrumental in helping to develop uh, everything that has happened on the way to get to the Obrey Project and then uh, things uh, since the Obrey Project started. And every time anyone is willing to do that work, you know, to roll up their sleeves and, and do something that is of such great importance to, to this project in general, uh, I consider that uh, a really wonderful thing uh, because uh, Yahweh knows I, I certainly can't do it all myself. There's way too, way too, way too much to it. And I'd, I'd really like to integrate more uh, into what the overall sphere is of what the Obrey Project is doing and, and expressing. So, um, you know, that's even more for, for a guy who's already uh, doesn't have the, the, the time, the materials, or anything else to even get what he's trying to get done done. So, please, those of you who are apt to prayer, pray for these people that, um, that, hey, that the Father will bless the work of their hands and mine. Um, in these pursuits. That's the best I can say. And 
Uh, I'm going to, uh, at the website, I've been doing some work on graphics and trying to restate some things, I, I think, that make it clearer uh, what, what the project is about. And I'd very much uh, like to see not only those people who are willing to do uh, some work, and that it usually entails uh, me as uh, the current director. I've got to figure out what things need to be done. And uh, of course, I allow input. I'm very, I'm very good about that. But, but ultimately, I have to sort of make decisions about uh, what things need to be done to just get us in in a place where where it's it's a pretty strong uh, looking overall picture, uh, and then incorporate um, more aspects to it. And and by that time, I would need be looking for more creative input. In the meantime, um, anybody with um, technical abilities that would like to contribute, um, I'm going to be putting on the research pa resources page, it'll be in red, um, the the things I'm, that I'm currently looking for, uh, for, for people to do and positions to fill that would be so helpful. And always what is helpful is financial support. So if you haven't been to the, the site yet, uh, go to the site. If you go to the donate page, what's going to happen is the, the second link, I'm trying to, to get rid of the first link button, which really doesn't take you anywhere uh, uh, good. It was supposed to be linked to PayPal, but I, I've, I've never worked with PayPal um, on, on this. I don't really like them. Um, so I've just pretty much stayed with, uh, with Patreon for now, and I'm sure there's other ways to, to do other things, and I'm sure I'll find out about them in time. Uh, but anyways, the second button will actually take you to the Patreon. So in any way that, that you feel that you can help with this, uh, please do reach out. I'm here. Uh, so until the next one, take care, everyone.